Vertical Sync, or V-Sync as it is more commonly known, is a tool like a hammer. It's easy to take for granted. When it works, and you swing that hammer, and it connects with the nail, or the game you are playing is running flawlessly, you probably don't even think twice about how the tool is being used. But as soon as that hammer head flies off mid-swing, and the game starts running into performance problems, well then we are confronted with the tool in its naked state, and we start asking questions about it. All of a sudden that tool can even seem like a burden, and an annoyance. How many times have you fuddled with various V-Sync options in a game in a vain attempt to make it feel smooth? Isn't that what V-Sync does? Makes things smooth? How annoying. Well, hopefully I can help inform your decision there, or at the very least help explain why that game you play all that time on your console looks the way it does on that screen of yours. So what is V-Sync? What does it do? That and more on this episode of Tech Focus. Just like my anti-aliasing video before this, the best starting point is what Vertical Sync tries to remedy. Tearing. Tearing happens because your monitor or television acts as an unknown or dumb receiving device. Without control, all it does is read the sent out visual signal from your GPU or console and displays it as it arrives. By itself, the monitor or television runs at a fixed refresh rate refreshing a line of visual information from the top to the bottom of the screen. This is commonly done at 60 times per second, or 60 hertz. When the graphics card or console sends out a new frame that has been rendered, it starts updating immediately on the screen at the location where the refresh cycle was. The screen is refreshing at some rate, an interval that does not match up lockstep with how quickly a GPU in that system will render out a frame. Even if your GPU or console could manage to pump out a frame constantly, perfectly, at a rate of 60 frames per second, or one frame every 16.667 milliseconds, it would still not necessarily line up perfectly with the refresh cycle of the screen. The new frame could appear perhaps every time in the middle of the display, causing a tear there. So you would see a big line where the new frame starts from where the old one ended. It can look pretty distracting to say the least. When manipulating the view of that rendered image in game, it can look like it is wobbling from side to side. Depending on your perspective, you can make this less distracting by increasing the frame rate of rendering on your GPU, making the tear lines more frequent, but less visually different. Doing so also would decrease the visual input latency, as you would technically be seeing the newest visual information all the time, albeit at more or less random locations for random intervals on the screen. Another way to make tearing less distracting is by increasing the refresh cycle of the display, thus increasing the chance of a less visually distracting lineup of the display and the rendered frame out from the GPU or console. What do I mean here? Well, obviously if a tear happens right in the middle of the screen, it would be pretty distracting as that's where your eye is concentrated on for most genres of games where you have control over the view direction. But if the tear occurred at an area of the screen where your eye commonly is not looking, well then you would not see the tear as often and it would be less visually distracting. So like here, where the tear is happening at the top of the frame in comparison to the middle, it is much less intrusive. This is especially true of games where the visual content is similar in color, like the darkness permeating all of Doom 3 for example. So that is tearing for you. You see the content rendered by the GPU more or less immediately after it is completed and sent over to the monitor. But it is visually distracting. So along comes VSync here to fix this visual distraction problem. VSync in its basic form syncs up the GPU to the fixed refresh rate of the display and pushes out its frames only at the moment that they concur with a new refresh. This syncing itself incurs a small penalty of lag or latency necessarily, but should your GPU be capable of rendering out a frame in less time or equal to, to the refresh time of the display, then you will have a perfect syncing of content from your GPU to your display. So other than this small latency penalty of sync up, everything should be looking pretty great. And if we're talking about a 60Hz display, the developer can also programmatically create an upper bound for their frame rate of their game 
so that the sync up occurs at 30 FPS, with a new frame occurring every two refreshes. That is how 30 FPS console games work with VSync or games on PC that have frame rate limiters. But what happens if your GPU or console is not capable of rendering out a new frame in that allotted refresh window, say 16.67 milliseconds for a 60 FPS game? or 33.33 milliseconds for a 30 FPS game. This is where things get hairy, and what happens depends on what type of V-Sync is in place, as there are multiple types. The key word here is buffers. How many are there, and what do they do? A buffer is just a word meaning a temporary container in memory of data or visual information. In this case, it's a frame. With a hard, double-buffered V-Sync, as in two buffers, there's a back buffer and a front buffer. The front buffer is just that frame that has essentially been rendered out and sent to the display. The back buffer is the frame currently in the making on the GPU to be sent out afterward. Nominally, the back buffer becomes the new front buffer in the moment it is ready to be sent to the display after the last refresh is finished. Here I say hard double buffered vSync as the GPU is waiting or stalled if the frame time for rendering was longer than the typical refresh rate of 16.67 milliseconds. You can think of it like this. The frame in the back buffer took longer than 16.67 milliseconds to be rendered, so it was never sent out to become the front buffer. The current front buffer is drawn again with the new refresh from the bottom to the top, and there is no new back buffer to be filled or rendered as there are only two buffers in total available. On your screen, you would see the same image over two refreshes, and the GPU is not working during that second refresh cycle on a new frame. It is stalled, since the back buffer is already full. This means that unless two consecutive frames individually render out in less than 16.67 milliseconds for a 60Hz display for a 60fps game, then you will be locked into only seeing a new frame every two refreshes until that is the case. In game when this happens, you see the frame rate drop from 60 to a brutal hard locked 30 FPS within a heartbeat, and it stays there until a perfect 60 FPS can be maintained again. This is obviously extremely distracting, and the sudden massive increase in visual latency here makes the controls feel non-responsive in general in comparison to how they just previously felt. A number of games use this type of V-Sync, as the developers imagined that the GPU would never drop or raise its frame time to cause such a swing in frame rate, or because they tied the game speed to refresh rate, as was common for some reason in many older titles. This can lead to the situation where many years later, games through backwards compatibility, for example, or games running on higher and GPUs can all of a sudden be running at 60 FPS, even though the original experience was 30 or lower, as that ceiling has been broken. A recent example of this is Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon Advanced Warfighter on Xbox One backwards compatibility, so yeah, we can see how double buffered VSync works. It's pretty great if you or the developer knows that the GPU or console will always push out a new frame in the time allotted till the next desired refresh cycle of one frame per refresh for 60 FPS or one frame per two refreshes for 30 FPS. But if the GPU cannot manage that, well then it can look and feel pretty bad. To remedy this problem, there are other modes of buffering, namely triple buffering, which comes in two basic flavors. The typical one that you see out there in the wild rather often is a triple buffering with a total of three buffers, one front buffer and two back buffers. This avoids that double buffered problem where the GPU stalls as the back buffer is filled. So when a frame takes longer than 16.67 milliseconds to render here, the front buffer is displayed again, but the GPU can then work on the other back buffer in the meantime. After this, back buffer one can be displayed, and if in that combined time, back buffer two is filled out, then it can be displayed by the next refresh. This is great, as it means you can have intermediate frame rates other than those that are just divisible by the refresh cycle. So instead of only having possible frame rates of 60, 30, 20, and so forth, you can have something like 47. You will see more visual information over the span of a second, but the method of this presentation and the costs of it are different. Since there will be moments where a frame is displayed for two refreshes, and then followed by two visually different frames over the next two refreshes, you will have visually inconsistent motion. It will look like small stutters. This is why a game like Mario Kart on Wii U has a periodic stutter, as it runs at an average of 59 FPS. 
Here, the closer your frame rate is to available divisible refresh rates will make the visual information on screen have more overall consistency. So 32 FPS will be more visually consistent than, say, 50 FPS, as more frames persist on the display for similar durations. 50 FPS, though, would of course have more visual information and a better visual input latency. Those moments where the GPU or console cannot render out a perfect 60 FPS, then triple buffering will have better input latency than double buffering. But at the same time, this type of triple buffering, in comparison to double buffering, also incurs a greater latency penalty when at a frame rate matching a divisible refresh rate. This is because the system is always going to be displaying the buffers in a sequential order, even if back buffer 1 is older than back buffer 2, and back buffer 2 is already completed. Also, there is the necessary setup cost of one frame of latency essentially by syncing up after the three buffers are already finished in the first place, instead of just the two that double buffering has. The more GPU headroom you have, and the less chance there are for dropped frames below the target rate, makes double buffering a better alternative. This style of triple buffering, though, can be found in games like the Uncharted series on PlayStation 3, or it is the default way the desktop Windows Manager will composite a game set to borderless window or window mode. As mentioned though, this is just one type of triple buffering. There's another, true type of triple buffering. True triple buffering allows the GPU to render as many frames as it wishes essentially, completely decoupling the performance of the GPU from the display refresh after the initial sync. When the front buffer is done being displayed on the screen for a refresh cycle, then the most recently completed back buffer is pushed out to the display, not having to display in sequential order. All intermediate frames are then discarded. This would give you faster than double buffered visual and input latency as you are always seeing the newest thing your GPU has rendered. At the same time, this can lead to a different type of visual stutter. Not because a frame persists on screen for two refresh cycles and is then followed up by single refreshes, like the other type of triple buffering. Rather, because the game world is updating with linear motion, and the GPU is taking slices from that at perhaps different intervals just as a frame becomes ready. So instead of a ball moving at perfect linear cadence over a sequence of frames, you can see it at different time slices as the intervening frames have been discarded. The ball would still end up in the same place, of course, but the apparent path it took to get there would maybe look like it accelerated or decelerated along the way. A way to help make this seem not so bad is by only allowing upper bound frame rates to be able to push out by the GPU that are divisible by the refresh rate. So 120, 180, 240, etc. for a 60Hz display so that the motion at least appears more visually consistent. Both AMD and Nvidia offer versions of this triple buffering on PC through fast sync and enhanced sync respectively, and is targeted for those games or play types where tearing is unacceptable, but the better input latency is preferred. So competitive games usually. Under refresh rate, this true triple buffering basically runs like normal triple buffering as far as I can see with my testing. So let's recap. Without vSync, you get tearing and it's pretty distracting. With double buffered vSync, you get more input latency, but visual consistency if the frame rate can be maintained to that level that is desired. So 60 or 30. Standard triple buffering gives you slightly worse input latency at the refresh rate target, or 30 FPS for example, but more visual information and better input latency at intermediate frame rates that it enables, like 45 FPS. True triple buffering gives you no tearing the best input latency, but requires a GPU capable of frame rates two times higher or more than the refresh rate. As a downside, it can also make visual movement on screen appear jittery and stuttery. Gosh, everything here seems to be give or take or less than ideal. Well, there are two solutions next to VSync, which work to remedy some of these problems. The first of which is adaptive VSync. Like normal VSync, it will wait to sync the frame up, with the next refresh rate of the target frame rate, so 30 or 60, but if that window is missed and the frame time for rendering goes above it, say above 16.67 milliseconds or above 33.33 milliseconds, instead of displaying that same frame again for another refresh cycle, it will instead drop vSync for that moment and allow the next frame to show up when it is finished. This then causes a tear to show up. This will of course have better input latency than double or triple buffering with the side effect of tearing when the game cannot maintain the target frame rate. 
Most recently, the Call of Duty games have employed this to great effect, as they tend to target extremely low latency controls even when the framerate dips. Remember how I mentioned that the location of the tear makes it more or less obvious? Well, developers also have control to make that frame back buffer wait a bit. For the price of a tiny bit of input latency, they can push the tear location away from the middle of the screen up to the display margins, usually at the very top. The Crisis Trilogy of games on Xbox 360 did this, for example. All in all, Adaptive Sync is a great way to maintain crisp controls and visual consistency in those games that have rarer, smaller dips below the target frame rate. But it won't really work if the game has frame rates that are all over the place. If the game tears slightly at the top when a massive explosion occurs, it's not the worst. While AMD does not provide this in its driver, NVIDIA offers full, half, third and quarter refresh rate adaptive sync in its driver, allowing you to get that console-like experience should you so wish. The last solution to the V-Sync dilemma is one I hinted at during the introduction to this video. In 2013, Nvidia unveiled G-Sync for fixed pixel displays, which is a total solution to the vertical sync problem. Instead of trying to line up the rendering work of the GPU to the display's fixed refresh rate, the GPU's work and render times control the refresh rate of the screen. So instead of having visually stuttery look when below the target refresh rate, the refresh rate of the monitor changes and the frame is updated fully from bottom to top with no tear. 47 FPS means 47 unique full screen refreshes. Originally, the technology had more limitations both in the form of G-Sync as offered by NVIDIA, or FreeSync, which is AMD's implementation of the VESA or VESA Adaptive Sync standard. Originally, if the frame rate were to get too low, like 35 FPS, triple buffered V-Sync would be engaged to prevent the screen from looking like it was flashing or strobing. The most modern variable refresh rate implementations and devices have completely eliminated this as they double, triple, or quadruple the refresh rate above the frame rate to maintain an adaptive refresh rate with no stutter. This makes those frames persist over multiple intermediate refreshes, so 35 FPS would actually be displayed at 70 refresh rate. This can technically introduce ghosting, something that also happens with 30 FPS games on many 60 Hz displays. Till very recently, variable refresh rate technology has for the most part been limited to expensive monitors, and decidedly more expensive ones when looking at G-Sync. But a number of modern televisions also include FreeSync these days, and it is only going to increase over time as the soon-to-be-integrated HDMI 2.1 standard is coupled with adaptive refresh rate. Important to note here is that NVIDIA still does not support these open standards on their GPUs, so you're limited to G-Sync there. Let's hope that changes as time goes on. So there you have it. V-Sync can be a bit complex with all of its different variations, but all the problems it can have also really make sense. In time, it will become a thing of the past though, as more televisions and monitors switch over to variable refresh rate, moving it beyond the PC space as mainstream consoles support it as well, such as the Xbox One X currently does. So what do you think? Does V-Sync make sense now? Can you make heads or tails of triple buffering and double buffering? Well, if you can, I also hope you enjoyed watching this video in the meantime and learning a bit about it. If you did like what you saw and heard, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. If you are already a subscriber, consider hitting that little bell in the corner to be informed as soon as Digital Foundry posts a video. If you want to talk with me about VSync or similar topics, write a comment below or follow me and Digital Foundry on Twitter. And as always, this is Alex, bidding you farewell and auf Wiedersehen.